as happens many times when the person doing the announcement seeks to find out who is assigned what to do, there's all sorts of editing that must go on. Tommy came up tonight checking to see if I was the one that was to do the speaking. And I noticed as he held down the little paper there, he made the statement that, uh, you know, everything seems to be changing. I said, there's a sermon in there. And that's the way it is with life. But Tommy, uh, great prophet Malachi declared in Malachi 3, Verse number six, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob, ye are consumed. Last book of the Old Testament, and God reminds everybody that he does not change. Coming toward the end of the New Testament, it is said of Jesus Christ, Hebrews 13 and verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Actually, if you put those two verses together, then it becomes obvious since Jesus doesn't change and God says he doesn't change, then Jesus must be God. Brethren, we do live in changing times, but I could stand in the first century and say, we do live in changing times. It's been the lot of every generation of people to think that, well, things are the way they are now and it's worse than it ever has been. But that's just not the case. Over a period of about 70 years, there's all sorts of whatever's going on in the world and every kind of upheaval and implosion to one extent or the other somewhere in the world all the time. And much of it in a 70 year period is going to impact somebody. But God doesn't change. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thus his way of salvation since the New Testament has come into effect, is the same. If one wants to become a Christian here, Spring, Texas, or China, or wherever in this world, it's the same truth for both. It doesn't make any difference where it is. It is the truth of the gospel of Christ that sets men free from sin, John 8, 31 and 32. And it is the great plan of salvation. That's the same, whether it's Africa or Canada or here. All men must believe the same thing, and they must obey the same thing. Now, it's interesting to note, in view of that great quality about God, that we have this statement made by the Apostle Paul as he's closing out the Galatian epistle. And he says in verse 7, chapter 6, Be not deceived. Now you'll notice that means I have the responsibility and you have the responsibility not to believe a lie. A lie is falsehood. If you believe a lie, you're deceived. Not any other way to be deceived than to believe a falsehood. And yet most people will believe falsehoods when it comes to salvation. For whatever reason, they do. Thus Jesus would say that there are few that find the way to salvation. And he said the reason for that is, is that straight is the gate. And narrow is the way that leadeth under eternal life, under righteousness, under heaven, under God, under salvation. It's always been that way. It hasn't changed. That word there is S-T-R-A-I-T in the King James Version. And that's different from S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. Straight, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, is like a straight line. 
And of course, the STRAIT can certainly fit into the definition of a straight line. And thus, sometimes uh, that word is used in the place in our modern day English of that old word, STRAIT. But STRAIT means a narrow, hemmed in passage that you cannot just haphazardly get down. You have to plan and you have to do what's necessary to get into that passage and to be able to get through that passage. And the way to heaven is like that. It's hemmed in all, all sides by the authoritative word of God. And if we are determined to live according to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, you're not going to be able even to enter into that way to heaven. Imagine a man that's covetous. He's got a money bag on his back that's as big as an elephant. And he's trying to get in this little passage, the entrance of which is about the size of a manhole. He can't do it. It's impossible. Same is true of a liar. Same is true of a thief. But those are sins of commission. The same thing is true of folks who leave undone what God obligates them to do also. It's too narrow for that. Truth's like that. Truth's just what a thing is. It doesn't change. You know, God is truth. God doesn't change and his truth doesn't change. That is the truth that he ordains for whichever generation it is. That is the patriarchal age had the truth God wanted people to believe then. You had to follow it. Same true of the Jew under the law of Moses. You had to follow it. No changing. None whatsoever. Over and over again, God would say, if you do what I tell you, if you keep my commandments, if you keep my precepts, if you obey me, I will be with you. Over and over again. I guess sometimes I ought to try to count that, but it's so many times it would be a bit of weariness to count the many times he said that. And what did the people do? went ahead and did what they wanted to anyway. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. To mock somebody is to belittle and to make light of, to make fun of, to take something valuable and make out like it's worthless. People mock God in all sorts of ways. And we mock God when we mock his word. But God doesn't change. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then he makes this statement. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You cannot sow wicked deeds and reap good things. You have to sow the good things. You can't sow wheat and reap watermelons. Impossibility. Very simple illustration. It teaches a powerful lesson. One that's always up to date. For he that soweth, notice this, how personal he gets. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now that word will read and mean the same way on the day of judgment as it reads and means right now. Thus this life is the time to be serious about God and godly things. You can't just stumble around through life and have a big time and be one of the best singers that ever was on the face of the earth and mess around with drugs because you could die in your bathtub at the peak of your life to accomplish what? What has been accomplished by that person? Oh, but she could do this. She could. What has been accomplished by that person? that is abiding. To stand before God in judgment, what can that person say? I had one of the best voices that a person could ever have. Therefore, I should go to heaven. And it seems so strange that so many times, so many people with tremendous talent in certain areas have very little self-control, don't know the more serious things of life, and yet they're held up by this present world as 
the great thing to be and to follow. God is not mocked. You can't lightly use the life He gave you, made in His very image, in a place designed to find heaven and say, well, I'll go to heaven anyway, regardless of how I lived on this earth. You will not do so. God is not mocked. You don't make light of those things. To be in this world and go to heaven, there must be a disposition of mind that says, I will seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. If that disposition is not in anybody's mind, number one, they can't be saved. If something else is more important than the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, you will die in your sins. Period. God is not mocked. He that soars to the flesh shall out of the flesh reap corruption. You don't have to be a fornicator. That's not what that means. It means if you live for the here and now, and that's all, though you may be a great philanthropist. You may be able to give all kinds of money. And you may be a good moral person. But if you don't live in the flesh to learn God's will by seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and doing His will, you're lost in sin. And I realize this is so politically incorrect. But it's the politically incorrect people that better watch out when all is said and done, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. How do you sow to the Spirit? Well, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, Ephesians 17. You're led by the Spirit when you follow the instrument the Spirit uses to convict you of sin, convert you to Christ, and live a pleasing life to God. That's what spiritual is. It's not like Casper the friendly ghost floating around and, oh, they're so spiritual. Spiritual is the person that walks very close with the authority of Christ in the New Testament. You know, the Bible does say, draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Well, don't expect Him to draw near to us when we don't draw near to Him. Well, how does anybody draw near to God? Well, just try learning His Word and living by it. And if you can't draw near to Him that way, there is no way to draw near to Him. You can have good feelings and you can feed millions and you can do all sorts of things. But if you don't know His Word and if you don't obey His will, all of that is not. Have we forgotten the picture the Lord gave of the judgment? And here are all these folks who were very busy, 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 active, 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 feeding people, doing great things. And what does the Lord say to them? Depart from me. Why? They even asked that question. Well, they did not do it on the Lord's terms. I don't care how good it may seem to people. Not done on the Lord's terms, not recognized by the Lord. I, the Lord, change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now listen to this, and then the lesson's yours. Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, Verse 10 of chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must. Now that's an imperative. You can't get around it. For you and for me and every other person that's ever lived in this world. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Have you ever walked in the courtroom when it was empty? And walked up and stood before that judgment bar that is the judge's bench and thought about the judgment of Christ. It's a bit sobering. Maybe we'll try that sometime to realize that someday that's what's going to be. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now why is that, Paul? That every one may receive the things done in his body According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Well, now, what did Paul conclude that we should do relative to that great fact? Listen to it. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we 
persuade men. Now that says to the church, you're saved because you humbly believed and obeyed the gospel. And you remain faithful because you live as the New Testament of the Christ says Christians are to live. But a part of that is what? Realizing that we must all, must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in the body, whether good or whether bad. What does that motivate anybody to do? If you're faithful to the Lord and love Him with your whole heart and love your neighbors yourself, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You know, when you look at the closing words of the writer to the Hebrews, persuading those Jews who were Christians not to depart from the New Testament system, but to repent and be faithful and bear up under the persecution for the cause of Christ. Did you, ever, did you ever notice what he says there? For those who refuse to follow the truth of the gospel system, to those, what is God? And God changes not. He says, for our God is a consuming fire. Yes, God stands today in his love and mercy saying, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. But spurn that. Mock that. Do your own thing. Fail to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Use your life in the way you want to and forget God's way of saying of teaching how we should live it. And see what happens when you fall in the hands of the living God when mercy is no more and there's no more grace and there's no more pleading to obey the gospel. Then there is the consuming fire. You who are troubled rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's as much a part of the gospel as coming to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. In fact, if we have more of that in us, maybe it will motivate us greater, motivate us greater to come to Christ for shelter and for help. I, the Lord, change not. God is not mocked. We must all appear before the judgment bar of Christ. So maybe when you do announcements, they do change a lot. And we all are changing every day in our physical bodies. All sorts of changes on the job and in government. Some for bad and some for good. I, the Lord, change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now I can say in closing that Tommy gets credit for this sermon. If you're subject to the blessed call of Jesus Christ who offers his salvation, believe that he's the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him as the Son of God, and complete your obedience by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sin. As a child of God, if you've wandered, if you've sinned, if you brought reproach upon the church publicly, please uh, repent of that sin. Come back to him in God's second law of pardon, confessing your sins. Let us pray for you. Let us pray with you that you can be forgiven. We invite you to come while we stand and sing. There is